Uh, I have about 25 minutes of material and 10, 15 minutes, so I'm going to talk fast. This is not intended to be uh, a review of all competing and emerging uh, sequencing technologies, but just sort of give you uh, a state of the art, uh, if you will. Talk a little bit about what we can do with this uh, at present, so you can think a little bit about uh, the whole genome versus exome uh, uh, discussion, um, and then try to give you... Uh, uh, some additional thoughts about how this might play forward. So, uh, of course, uh, the ability to sequence a human genome has, has come a long, long way just in the last eight years. Uh, the old technology, you know, it was possible in 2004 to sequence your human genome, but you needed about $15 million in the bank account, uh, and you would need to wait for a few years. Of course, the next-gen technology has just completely revolutionized uh, not only what we can do, but the questions we can ask by sequencing. Uh, the Illumina uh, technology is arguably the best that's out there right now for these tasks. Uh, the cost is actually probably dropping even more so than what I have. I think if you come to St. Louis with uh, 100 nanograms of your DNA, uh, by the, uh, within a, a week or two, you'll leave with a hard drive with all the data on there, all the variants called, probably for somewhere around $3,500 inclusive. Uh, we've applied this now to a number of problems. One of the first big successes uh, was uh, in uh, the study of the cancer genome. Uh, this slide just represents uh, a genome that we sequenced, the first cancer genome, back in 2007, 2008, when the technology was known uh, as Selexa. And even with these short 32 base pair uh, reads and no uh, paired end sequencing, it worked. We were actually able to get into the, the tumor normal genome comparison of this cancer patient uh, and find uh, the only uh, somatic mutations that are present in, in the tumor. It was just a small number of 10. This has gone, we've gone on now to sequence thousands of cancer genomes uh, at our center and the other uh, centers that are funded by NHGRI uh, as well as around the world. Uh, and I think what we've really gotten good at uh, besides just data production and, uh, you know, for much less money and uh, in a much shorter time period, is actually the analysis of the human genome. Part of the way that uh, we solve this problem is to reduce complexity as much as possible. A system that we devised a few years ago is to simply divide the genome into tiers. Tier one uh, is uh, what you might call the exome. This is about 1.3% 1 1 of the human genome sequence and it's all of the coding region and other uh, uh, genes that are uh, well annotated. Uh, there's another 8.5%, which is the region of the genome that's conserved across all 28 mammals that have been sequenced uh, to good depth. Uh, another 41% of the genome uh, is uh, non-repetitive, uh, leaving about 50% uh, that is repetitive. So most of the analysis obviously focuses on the red and orange areas, uh, as we sequence across multiple uh, participants in a particular study, be it uh, somatic or germline, quite often we will see what look to be um, interesting variants or mutations in these other tiers. Uh, there's no annotation in terms of the function of those, but simply by the fact that we see them popping up in, uh, in genome after genome gives us some uh, uh, notion that they, those might be interesting. There's a tremendous amount of uh, software tools that have been developed for looking both at germline and uh, germline variants, somatic mutations. This just shows you uh, a pipeline uh, that's uh, uh, used at our center. Um, a number of different software tools uh, that are used uh, to identify either single nucleotide variants, insertions and deletions. Additional software is used to find uh, structural variation that sort of falls in the black hole between what you might find with um, sequencing and what you might find with, uh, say, cytogenetics or, or SNP arrays. Uh, there are uh, other modes of these pipelines that can be then applied uh, to a large cohort study, and uh, we often use the same annotation rules that we developed for the cancer genomes, and all of these tools are, of course, uh, available from our website as well as from SourceForge. This also can be fit into a, a much broader pipeline that takes whatever clinical uh, information is, is available. So again, features from genome or exome sequences over here on the left merge into this major pipeline where we bring in functional annotation from many different databases. And as we move through various filters, 
and we start to consider candidate genes and pathways, we can bring in uh, the uh, 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 appropriate uh, drug uh, gene interactions uh, and end up with something called uh, clinically actionable events. And this is work uh, largely of a, a, a fellow in our uh, center uh, by the name of Malachi Griffith. This is a very powerful approach to the study of various um, cohorts. You're looking at here uh, the results from uh, whole genome sequencing of 200 AML patients. Uh, that's been done in St. Louis. Uh, and you're basically just seeing uh, the most commonly mutated genes uh, in these uh, particular cancers. One of the things that we've been able to do by just uh, bringing together excellent uh, clinical phenotype data is we're starting to identify, shown by asterisks here, uh, the small number of genes that help us get some idea when this biopsy is first done and the patient uh, is assessed by simply sequencing a few genes which of the patients might have a more high-risk uh, aggressive disease uh, and should be treated uh, thus more aggressively, uh, and which may have a, a much longer uh, event-free survival. We're able to use the genome sequencing data to, to delve into some pretty uh, amazing uh, uh, things that happen in some of these cancer genomes. This is just the results from uh, a study that we did uh, about two years ago uh, a patient came into the clinic, uh, the cytogeneticist saw one thing and recommended a bone marrow, bone marrow transplant. The pathologist said, no, I think if we simply put her on all transretinoic acid, she'll be fine. The oncologist uh, was part of our AML uh, genomics group and said, can we just sequence her genome and see what's going on here? Uh, and what we found is a, a small region from chromosome 17. Uh, replaced a, uh, a five base pair region on chromosome seven, uh, resulting in a fusion of uh, the PML and RAR alpha genes, which is common uh, in uh, leukemia, but typically by uh, translocation that can be seen by the cytogeneticist. Uh, uh, she was treated with ATRA, uh, went into remission, and uh, is still doing well uh, two years later. So being able to pick up this fine structure uh, is key, and these are things that uh, if we had simply done exome sequencing uh, for this particular case, we wouldn't have uncovered uh, the problem. One of the other key features of next generation sequencing is it's digital in nature. The old capillary sequences were essentially analog signals uh, because you were sequencing a population of molecules. Every sequence read that we get on an Illumina machine derives from a single molecule. We amplify along the way. Uh, but the truth is, nonetheless, that, that it is digital. So we can count reads uh, within uh, a sequencing experiment. And as shown here, by, by counting reads and assigning uh, allele frequencies to, to the mutations that we find, uh, we can get some understanding of the heterogeneity that's present in a tumor sample. So what we've actually done here is sequence three genomes, normal from this patient, uh, the de novo uh, tumor that was found at the initial biopsy, and then over here on this axis, we're showing uh, the results from the genome sequence of a relapse tumor uh, that was taken uh, about uh, 12 months after the patient's uh, initial diagnosis. So you see here, these in gray are all of the somatic events uh, that are present in both the de novo tumor as well as in the relapse. And then we have additional uh, events here shown in purple which are present in the de novo tumor but are lost in the relapse tumor. We also have some other clusters of mutations that are enriched for the relapse, and then we have a group over here that are not seen in the primary tumor. They're only present in the relapse. And we hypothesize that there's a temporal nature, so we might be able to, to suss out a bit, even though we're working with only three snapshots instead of a movie, uh, the evolution uh, of this relapse tumor. And we're able to build a model such as is shown here, this is the patient's uh, tumor uh, at the initial uh, biopsy. Here's a second biopsy that was taken when the patient was re in remission after chemotherapy. And then this is the result uh, of a biopsy taken at the point of relapse. You can see the most dominant clone present uh, at uh, diagnosis was completely eradicated by chemotherapy. And the tumor that essentially then expanded with additional mutations and uh, is responsible for the relapse uh, was present at only 5% in that initial tumor sample. So these are the kinds of things that we can find with these uh, 
besides just simply finding mutations or interesting variants in genes and so forth? What are additional opportunities in uh, large cohorts? Basically, three options for sequencing. Uh, this is, that's a bit of a simplification, but I think it probably works for the uh, uh, reasons of uh, uh, conversation. So targeted sequencing, where we make use of this technology that sort of emerged in the last few years, uh, hybrid capture. We simply make probes to all of the regions of the genome or regions of genes that we want to sequence. Uh, we do hybridization and we use uh, some method of uh, extraction, magnetic beads or so forth, to pull those targeted regions away from the remainder of the genome. So this works well. We can simply make a list of candidate genes that we'd like to sequence for a particular disease or phenotype or perhaps regions of interest. These might be GWAS peaks. Uh, and then simply capture and sequence these in a large collection of samples. We can expand this to include all genes, and this, of course, is exome sequencing, and there are a number now of commercially available reagents, probes, uh, that uh, approach the exome, uh, and there are many definitions of the exome, uh, uh, in a way to try to ideally catch all CCDS exons and other selected uh, RNA genes. And then lastly, of course, there's whole genome sequencing where we simply go after uh, the whole thing. So whole genome or exome, a couple of pros and cons are shown on this slide. Uh, exome sequencing, of course, costs way less than uh, whole genome, about a sixth uh, of the cost uh, at present, because there's still a lot of biochemistry that needs to happen before you ever get to the sequencing machines. Uh, the analysis is greatly simplified. You're typically operating on only about six megabases, uh, 60 megabases of the genome. Uh, thus, you can sequence more samples. Uh, so uh, more study power, perhaps, with an exome versus whole genome approach. And you're essentially getting at the low-hanging fruit. Uh, the, you're looking at the annotated region of the genome, and hence it's going to be a little uh, easier to sort of tie that to the biology. Uh, whole genome sequencing uh, has the advantages of also sampling all non-exonic variants, this tier 2 and tier 3 that I mentioned a bit earlier. Uh, and uh, there's good evidence, of course, that these may play a role in various uh, human diseases. Whole genome sequencing also uh, resolves the fine structure around deleted genes and exons, uh, similar to what I showed you uh, earlier for the one leukemia case that we sequenced. Um, this is also uh, a good way uh, to understand what's happened if a particular gene or a region of a gene is deleted. With exome sequencing in this case, you would simply get a negative report. Uh, the whole genome will cover exons that are not covered or poorly covered by the capture reagents. One of the things to keep in mind is that uh, you're trying to do hybridization uh, and fit it all into uh, one universal uh, uh, condition uh, where you have uh, you know, various GC contents and so forth uh, aiming to be captured. And there are a lot of good tricks that have been employed, so these reagents are good, but they're still... Uh, genes and uh, exons that uh, they do not uh, pick up. Uh, and lastly, the whole genome sequencing will allow you to resolve structural variation. Uh, again, similar to what I showed, showed you, cryptic translocations and so forth. Uh, you can pick up copy number variation, some that are missed by SNP arrays and so forth. Well, how well do the exome reagents work? Uh, they're pretty good, and I've listed uh, a number of them over here. Uh, we tend to use this one from NimbleGen. Uh, there's one from Agilent here. Illumina now has their own exome reagent. And you can see in parentheses the amount of uh, the genome that each of these capture reagents target. You can see how Illumina did, or sorry, NimbleGen did a nice job of evolving, adding more content to their uh, 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 reagent here. Uh, we compare these all relative to something that we call WooSpace, which is our in-house definition of the exome. This is about 47 megabases and includes all CDS exons, RNA annotations from uh, the various databases, uh, 38,000 gene names, 120,000 transcript names, etc. All right, And you can see that even for these best reagents, we're still targeting only about 70-75% of what we would uh, really ideally like to capture with these reagents. And, and these continue to evolve. They, they will add content. Quite often, we'll spike in uh, additional probes for regions that we know are poorly covered and so forth. Another thing to keep uh, in mind is that we can, when we sequence uh, exomes or when we sequence uh, just selected regions of interest, we're really underusing the Illumina capacity. The, the HiSeq 2000 now 
generates about 300 plus gigabases of sequence data uh, per flow cell, and we run two flow cells every time we turn on the instrument. Uh, so uh, a lot of people have devised uh, these indexing or barcoding schemes that have allowed us to come up with really nice sort of pooling and multiplexing uh, uh, methods uh, to, to make better use of uh, the technology. So uh, we simply would make libraries. Uh, the black region here indicates the target sequence. Uh, we have uh, two library adapters, one over here in red, one over here in purple. The purple one in this case has a small green tag uh, of six bases. And we can take two different DNA samples and two different of these uh, adapters with different six base pair tags. We can make libraries, so we have uh, DNA fragments such as this with all these uh, unique regions in the middle. Uh, and then we can go through all of the steps before sequencing. The key thing here is that after we constructed libraries, we can actually pool these samples. And this is going to make all of the work, as well as all the DNA sequencing, much easier, much more uh, economical. We then demultiplex uh, using software tools, align to reference sequence, and uh, execute variant detection. So uh, after that demulti uh, demultiplexing is done, uh, because of our little barcode tags, we know which sequences came from which individual DNA samples, and we can look uh, at the various regions where we might have variants uh, showing up uh, and then again know uh, which individuals these derive from. We can take this to an extreme where we simply start with a 96-well plate of these indexed DNA libraries, use our capture probes, uh, do sequencing, uh, and then end up with the data. Going with 96 samples, uh, uh, 96 samples per lane, and there are eight lanes on each of the two flow cells that, that we use. Uh, we get very nice coverage across genes, very uniform on-target uh, results, uh, and very high enrichment um, uh, uh, factors. We've now used these in St. Louis for quite a number of projects. Uh, this is all targeted sequencing, sub-exome, where you can see we've started out, say, in uh, metabolic syndromes with a target region of about a quarter megabases, up to this cleft lip, pro cleft lip project where we've targeted about six and a half megabases in the genome, and we've done these in uh, uh, fairly large numbers of samples. This works well. This is just one really good result from the metabolic syndromes um, where we found uh, a number of... Uh, uh, variants in our targeted sequencing that all correlated nicely with this uh, gene here. So uh, just in terms of giving you some thoughts about costs and how we might uh, uh, utilize these various um, uh, approaches uh, in a large-scale sequencing project, let's just start with a budget, uh, an arbitrary budget of $10 million, uh, and this is focused only on data production. Uh, targeted sequencing, uh, done the way that I explained it on previous slides, uh, for a targeted set of up to four megabases or a targeted uh, set of between four and eight megabases, uh, you could see that uh, for a cost of about $200 per DNA sample, uh, you're looking at uh, being able to, to use that uh, sort of funding uh, to sequence 50,000 uh, individual DNA samples. It falls off a little bit when the target uh, region uh, expands a bit. Uh, exome sequencing using commercial reagents with about a 60 megabase target. This has actually fallen down below uh, $1,000 per exome. It's closer to about $700 uh, per exome now. And this is using, again, indexing where we can uh, uh, sequence five individual DNAs uh, in a single lane on the, uh, on the Illumina flow cell. And then whole genome sequencing, uh, typically we're right around 30x coverage, although we tend to dial this in, depending exactly on the questions asked and the nature of the DNA samples. Uh, but uh, at uh, a conservative $5,000 per genome cost, uh, this extends out to 2,000 genomes. These costs include library production, capture and reagents, sequence uh, for se uh, reagents for sequence production, data processing and storage, which is actually one of the more expensive components uh, of the process, and an initial pass through variant detection. My costs here don't include higher level, higher level analyses or validation. And I will stop there. Thank you. Questions? We have about five minutes. Oh, I could have talked slower. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Rick. Rick. How, how many samples can you multiplex at a time? How, so how many patients can you run at the same time? So the best results so far have been, we've, we've pushed it up to 96 per lane. 
And it's simply a question of, get, you, you've heard about these multiplexing schemes for a long time with great claims of having four or 5,000 codes. Yeah, the problem is, is that it's just like the hybrid capture business. They don't all perform uniformly and you need that to get a good result. So 96 is the upward limit right now, I would say. Yeah. Rick, could you speculate on what you think the next two years will bring with respect to, you know, increasing the percentage of both the exome and the whole genome that we miss? As you suggested, 75 percent, you know, the exome is really caught by what we have now with high enough quality. And then similarly, we miss, what, 10 to 15 percent of a whole genome uh, due to all sorts of things. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, many are worried that a lot of, of interesting things are embedded in those particular places. And so the question of revisitation and, you know, do you do it once or are a lot of these people going to potentially need to be sequenced the second time with a supplementary technology or something so that at some point we can really say we have thoroughly sequenced them as opposed to sequencing them very yeah, well? It's a great question, Steve. Exome, incrementally better. Uh, Again, and I think there's there's an opportunity for sort of, uh, you know, rogue boosting of, of performance. So like I said, um, we just started thinking really a lot about Alzheimer's disease sequencing. But one of the things that uh, we discovered is that uh, APP has exons that are basically not covered by some of the exon, exon reagents. So we'll spike it and we'll, we'll make sure that we boost those up for, for the those missing exons. We've done this for cancer, right? P53, first couple of exons, poorly covered, right? So how, how much of that happens at the, the company versus how much of it happens sort of among the folks that are really driving the projects? I think that's, that's an important question that's, that's yet to be answered. I think for whole genome, the problem is, so there, there are two things. I mean, we have to get better at the reference. Uh, People at NHGRI hear this from me all the time. Um, and we're working on that, but we need to work harder and we need to have more resources in the mix. That's my uh, you know, funding comment for the night. Um, you have been talking to us about it. Yes, I know. <laughs> but I think the, the tougher problem is, is um, resolving sequences that are very similar when we only have 100 base pair reads. All right, so we continue to bang on that. We expect that we'll get a little longer, but so for example, think about uh, MHC genes, right? We, we don't resolve all of those because they're very similar. If we had a 400 base pair read, it would be a different ball game. So do I see the Illumina technology going to 400 bases? Probably not, not in the next couple of years. Do I see it extending maybe 50 bases in the next couple of years? Good chance of that. So that was a good question about the coverage, but what about cost? Uh, five years from now, will we be doing whole exome sequencing, or will it just seem like there's no need to limit yourself? Well, there's a, what, what do I think and what do I hope? You know what I hope, right? Uh, because I think just, you know, having, having seen the things that we've seen in these whole genomes that we've done for cancer, there's, we find all kinds of stuff that we're not going to get with exomes. And so we want to push for more. Um, the, how much cost will come down, I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a little bit of an artificial ingredient right now that is because of the different commercial players. So for example, there's lots of reports of Illumina doing whole genome sequencing in-house for as little as $2,000, right? Why is that? It's because there's another company up the coast that's sequencing for cheaper and cheaper. So those $2,000 costs are true, but they're subsidized, and they're probably not going to continue. So what will happen with costs? I think costs will, again, incrementally creep down over the next couple of years, just like exome reagents and our ability to better resolve what we see in, exome, or in whole genome sequence data will creep up incrementally. You know, it's nice to think about a new technology popping onto the scene, Oxford Nanopore, you know, suddenly, suddenly somebody at Pac Bio has a wonderful breakthrough and all the problems with there go away, but there's a lot of things that I think have to happen there. So I think, I think I'm more optimistic about the incremental improvements over the next year and a half as I, than I am about the whiz bang thing happening. Rick, let me ask you a question about somatic variation, which you've thought more about than most is, 
you know, but outside of cancer. I mean, the people in this room are coming together with large sample sets, and we use the word cohorts. And often in cohort studies, we have a sampling structure, and we follow these people over time. We typically think of it as sequencing and then adding clinical information over time. And I wonder if we need to think beyond that of, of looking at genomic variation over time and thinking about the impact of genomic variation over time on health. But again, my question is going beyond cancer. If you comment on that. Well, I, I think the only place that I've seen that so far is in cancer, right? And uh, it, it's, it's been very powerful. Uh, it, it, it is, you know, the other place that we've done this besides the relapse tumors in leukemia are the metastatic tumors uh, in solid tumors in ca some cases where we've had multiple mets going to different uh, organs and you essentially end up uh, building a phylogenetic tree for five or six different genomes from the same patient. So it, it works well. Uh, it's pretty powerful. And I, I don't see any reason why you couldn't extend that to simply, you know, temporal sequencing of individuals in a cohort. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Right. Um, so uh, 